Well, um, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for coming. I'm really delighted to see um, all of you today. I want to welcome you to tonight's Ask With Forum with Cheryl Cashin and Richard Rothstein. Um, the uh, Ask With Forum is a series of public le lectures that brings, brings leaders in education um, to share new knowledge and generate spirited conversation and offer insight into the highest priority challenges facing education. Um, and just wanted to let you know that there will be a book signing um, with Cheryl Cashin with her new book um, right outside after the forum. So um, please stick around for that if you want a copy of the book, if you're intrigued, which I think you will be. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers, and they're going to come and uh, talk to you about um, their uh, perspectives, and then we're going to sit down for a conversation, and then we'll open it up to all of you. So I'll start with Cheryl Cashin, um, who is a professor of law at Georgetown University. Um, she teaches administrative law, constitutional law, and race and American law, among other subjects. Uh, and she ri Cheryl writes about race relations, government, and inequality in the United States. Today, um, she's going to be uh, talking to you about her new book, Place, Not Race, A New Vision of Opportunity in America. Um, and she's also written a book on the failures of integration. Um, and she's uh, published uh, widely in, in academic journals as well as in the LA Times, the Washington Post, Education Week. She's been on NPR, The Diane Reem Show, Tava Smiley, um, News Hour with Jim Lehrer. Um, she also worked in the Clinton White House um, and was a law clerk to uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall. Um, and um, she is uh, a graduate of Harvard Law School as well. Um, and um, we're looking forward to her remarks. She's going to start us off. Um, but before I turn it over to Cheryl, I also want to introduce our, um, our respondent, Richard Rothstein. Um, they've had a spirited debate in the American Prospect magazine that is going to continue this evening. Um, uh, Richard is a visiting scholar here at HGSC. Um, she's, he's also a research associate of the Economic Policy Institute and a senior fellow of the Chief, Chief Justice Earl Warren Institute on Law and Social Policy at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Um, from 1999 to 2002, uh, Rothstein was the national education columnist for the New York Times. Um, he's written numerous books, um, the last of which was Grading Education, Getting Accountability Right. Um, his recent work focuses on the history of, of residential segregation. He spoke here at HGSC just last week about the history of segregation um, in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and I encourage you to read that piece that's also in um, the American Prospect. Um, and uh, the relationship between residential segregation and, social and government policy. Uh, he's a contributing editor to the American Prospect, um, and um, prior to his work at EPI, he was a program analyst for the LA um, School Board, and he was also um, in, uh, a public school teacher, um, a college instructor, and, and a union officer and representative. Um, so I'm sure you're going to, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, an ex the, um, this exchange, and I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl to um, start us off. Hello, thank you for coming out to hear this um, debate, hear my perspectives. It's a real honor to be back at Harvard. Uh, it's been an honor to be asked to participate in this forum. Um, I'm going to talk for, I've been told, for 15 minutes to give you an overview of my argument. And I want to begin with a caveat and to say that nothing in my book is required by the Constitution. I'm not an advocate of colorblind constitutionalism. I, I do believe that the Constitution permits uh, schools like Harvard to consider race. My argument is based in public policy and, and what I think would make sense from a perspective of public policy, not what I think the Constitution requires. Um, I want to talk about um, opportunity and opportunity hoarding. Um, in many ways, I feel privileged to be middle-aged I grew, I graduated from high school in 1980 from a, a, a good but not stratospheric um, public high school in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, my activist parents were broke. We didn't live in a fancy neighborhood, but the schools I had available to me enabled me, a co-valedictorian of my high school, to get into schools like Vanderbilt and Princeton, and I went to Vanderbilt on a full scholarship. Um, that said, the valedictorian of my high school today 
would likely not get much attention from any selective institution because the school and the neighborhood surrounding it has gone from being middle class and integrated to being heavily black and poor. And you know, what has happened? Um, you know, I, I got to go to school when America was making good on the promise of integration, and good on the promise of Brown v. Board. It wasn't perfect, but you know, 43% of black students in the South um, in 1980 were attending, attending integrated schools and each year um, the achievement gap was closing. But since um, that time, um, you know, uh, segregation, your schools have resegregated and neighborhoods have become increasingly stratified by income. In fact, only 42% of all Americans today live in a middle class neighborhood. And that's down from 70 percent, um, from 65 percent in 1970. What has happened over the decades um, is that the affluent and the highly educated increasingly live in their own environments. Um, and I have a map to illustrate that. Okay, what you're seeing is a color-coded map which are the darkest areas are areas where 40% or more of the people have a college degree. And in fact, there, there are 3,000 counties in the United States of America. Only 17 of them are counties where more than half of the population have a college degree. And in fact, you know, college people with uh, college degrees used to be more integrated in American society. Everybody's looking at, where did I grow up? You want to see where I grew up? Okay. Huntsville, Alabama, somewhat dark. If I had been one county over, I probably wouldn't have landed at Princeton, but that's where I grew up. Rocket City, Huntsville, Alabama. Um, uh, only 17 counties in America have a population where more than half have a college degree. Um, segregation of college, the college educated from everyone else has tripled since 1940. And where are these counties, these 17 counties concentrated? You could probably guess where they are. Um, affluent counties, Marin County, north of San Francisco, um, the Research Triangle in North Carolina, suburbs of Washington and New York, um, places where college recruiters flock to. Um, and this concentration of human capital um, in some places, intellectual capital, in some places and not others, leads to what I call opportunity hoarding. Um, and you know, a, a dean of a very prestigious law school said this at a meeting and it really resonated with me. With me. Um, those that are accord, uh, afforded highly selective K through 12 education um, are set up very well to enter an elite private college or an elite college and become leaders, and everyone else gets to watch it on television, right? And this is what's happening. You know, these pale areas, these are, get to watch the leadership class that comes out of places like Harvard become leaders. Um, and the, the phenomenon of opportunity hoarding that I underscore in the book is that place increasingly defines. Um, who has access to quality and who doesn't in education, and it tends to lock in advantages and disadvantages over time. When you put, and, 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 and in fact, it's not just segregation by counties within metropolitan regions, the highly educated are increasingly more isolated in their own neighborhoods than are African Americans. Um, and when you put uh, affluent people concentrate and highly educated people concentrate in their own neighborhoods in direct competition for scarce resources. Um, um, affluent jurisdictions win. No one says out loud that our public policy should be to give affluent schools and neighborhoods more and better resources, but that happens. And I chronicle that in, in, in a, a chapter of my book in my own struggle to discuss decide where my family uh, should live in Washington, D.C. That happens as a result of con a concentration of motivated parents who know how to access what they want. Now, to the next slide. Let me, when you overlay, I want to overlay race with it. Come on, next slide. <laughs> a 
Okay, sorry, he's a t I'm impatient because I only have 15 minutes, but okay. <laughs> Let me tell you what we're looking at. We're looking at um, Connecticut. Why Connecticut? Because this was what was available to me. This is a geographic mapping of educational opportunity with an overlay of race. The, the darkest areas are the highest educational opportunity places and the palest areas are the lowest. And that's map, and this uh, a fair housing center asked the Kirwan Institute at Ohio State to do this for them. And um, this, the, the opportunity stratification is based on um, test scores in reading and math, um, the qualifications of the teachers, you know, how, what percentage of the teachers are certified to teach what they're teaching, those kinds of things. And they overlaid this with race. The little green dot is 500 non-white people, right? And not surprisingly, non-white people are heavily concentrated in low opportunity places, but I argue that place captures the complexity of who has access to, uh, to, to educational opportunity here because not some um, people of color get to live in miraculous places like West Hartford where affluent college educated people um, have managed to achieve some measure of, of integration. Um, um, and then some pale counties, low opportunity, don't have any non-white people, right? Um, and in the old days, frankly, if you talk to people, black people of a certain generation who are alumni from institutions like Harvard, a lot of them came from places like this. In the old days, affirmative action operated in a way where they would, they would get people um, from um, you know, low opportunity places, but increasingly what's happening because of the in, disproportionate, nefarious, evil influence of US News and World Report, um, <laughs> and I, yes, I said it. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, you know, if you think about it, where are you, if you're with, with phenotypical race-based affirmative action, the easiest place to get your phenotypical diversity is to go here and to get, uh, frankly, um, very advantage, the least, the least segregated and the most advantaged people of color um, because you'll do that with the least cost to your median SAT scores and with the least cost in terms of financial aid. Um, and my argument in a nutshell is that I, just from, these are students, including my own kids, who are more privileged than I could barely stand some days. Um, they take all my money, right? Um, although we're in public school. These are kids that are in the game. They are going to go to college. They will probably get, they, if, they, if they take advantage of the, the resources they have, and often, these are not African Americans, by the way, right? African immigrants who come to America, and I welcome them, um, they, they tend to live in more integrated settings, right? Um, but they're in the game, they will go to, to college, and if they work hard and, and take the most challenging classes that are available to them, they will get into a good school, if not a great school. Meanwhile, there are millions of children of color who are immorally, stuck in separate and unequal schools, and this is the unfinished business of the civil rights movement. And my argument is that, affirm I'm actually arguing for something much more radical than holding on to what remains of affirmative action. And we could talk in Q&A, I could tell you what remains of race-based movement, rather than holding on to that policy, I'm arguing for something much more radical. I'm arguing that we should take the lessons of decades of affirmative action and apply it to the entire process, right? We should de-emphasize standardized test scores. We should scrub the admissions process of any practices that aren't truly tied to merit, that don't truly predict um, what, um, you know, how a person is going to do in, in, in school. Um, and de-emphasize test scores and compare the achievements to the, of the students to the resources that they had available to them, right? Um, 
And I'm not talking about watering down standards, but I'm talking about revolutionizing them. But so a hot, the valedictorian of Ferguson, Missouri, deserves a leg up in admissions. The person who has had to overcome these enduring structures of men, and I don't care what color they are, right? The person who has had to endure these enduring structures of segregation and um, needs and deserves a leg up in admissions, right? I, but I also argue that standardized tests should be optional or not used at all. That financial aid should return to being based on need, not so-called merit. That legacy preferences should be scrapped. And that any institution that is serious about real diversity on their campuses should be working, partnering with an organization like QuestBridge or Posse that are very good at finding high achieving students from disadvantaged places of all colors that can come to a campus like Harvard and do the work. So that, that's my argument uh, in a nutshell. And, and I'll close, I, I think, I don't know if I've used up all my 15 minutes, but um, I've tried to be quick. Uh, I'll, I'll close by saying that uh, I think it's very important that, that I mean, you, you hear arguments about how race equals merit. I, I think place equals merit in the sense that um, a student that has had to overcome these structural disadvantages and still is high achieving, is still an A student, is still taking the hardest things ava classes available to them, um, um, you are when, you, when, you, when you consider where they came from, you are screening for all of these kinds of non-cognitive skills that Paul Tuff's book, um, you know, How Children Succeed, shows, predicts that stick to itness, that resilience. It other, also reflects merit in the sense of, if you look at the um, um, mission statements of universities, there's tons of research that shows that traditionally affirmative action candidates with lower test scores come closest to meeting the mission statements. Almost all mission statements say something about, you know, giving back to the world and you know, we want to create leaders who give back to the world. Well, uh, you know, a person who comes from a disadvantaged place has been shown to be much more likely to be willing to go back to their neighborhood and do something for someone. Um, and the final thing that I will say in coming to this, 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 this position, place not race, is I prefer, we have to, I think it's important to think about where we want to end up in this country. Um, and I prefer um, pursuing diversity in a way that helps people who are actually disadvantaged and that forces people to acknowledge this unremediated segregation and, and have people who struggle there to, to have that acknowledged. I think that's a healthier place to be. It's more unifying. It also says on a campus like this to black and Latino students, you know, I didn't get here because of my skin color. I got here because I worked hard and I overcame stuff that I wish you, you know, I would love for you to live one day in my shoes and have to overcome what I had to overcome. I deserve to be here, maybe even more than you. And I think that's a more positive message. I also think it's more unifying going forward to create diversity in a way that encourages rather than discourages cross-racial alliances. Thank you. Cheryl's argument, and, and I'm not speaking only of her, there's, uh, it's quite popular these days to argue for colorblind uh, admissions policies, is that universities, selective universities uh, like Harvard, but uh, any selective university, should be seeking disadvantaged students from the poorest neighborhoods. And she also, in her book, argues families, uh, even if they don't, live in the poorest neighborhoods uh, who have little wealth accumulation uh, is distinct from the kinds of students who typically, um, not, no, not yet, please. Oh, that's here, okay, never mind. <laughs> um, uh, that typically attend uh, elite universities. Uh, I disagree with this position. Uh, I, my argument is that uh, universities should pursue race-based affirmative action it should not be abandoned, uh, and I will explain later 
a little bit about uh, what more they need to do. I'm not opposed to, uh, uh, certainly, to universities reaching out to disadvantaged students uh, of any race, um, but uh, I think they are two separate policies that need to be pursued simultaneously. Now, I have two reasons uh, for, for uh, this position, and um, I think we need to distinguish them quite clearly, and I think many of the advocates of colorblind affirmative action uh, confuse the two and don't distinguish them. So let me try to distinguish them and, and explain why um, I take the position that I do. The first issue is that, as we all know, we have uh, enormous and substantial inequality in this country and too limited intergenerational mobility. Children who come from poor families are too, also uh, likely to be poor as adults. Children whose parents are poorly educated are also likely to be poorly educated themselves. While educational policies, both at the K through 12 level and in higher education, can play a small role in combating this inequality and this lack of upward mobility, the most important reforms to address these are, this is not, are not educational but economic. For example, if we want to enhance the share of students from disadvantaged families who go to college and who go to the most competitive colleges, it will be far more useful to increase the minimum wage, to reform labor markets, to create incentives for employers to schedule irregular, not to schedule irregular and part-time shifts, to strengthen laws that govern union collective bargaining, to address the mortgage foreclosure epidemic, and to increase the earned income tax credit, to name just a few. All of these will enable parents to provide better care for their children in more stable environments and enhance the ability of those children to thrive in school and be competitive for college. One problem with our public policy discussions generally is that because academics disproportionately participate in them, there's a tendency to grossly exaggerate the role that education can play in solving our social problems. I've written a great deal about this, as some of you may know about, with regard to elementary and secondary education. If we really want to boost elementary and secondary education outcomes, for example, we'll get more bang for the buck by funding more nurse-family partnerships, by funding early childhood care, by uh, creating school-based health clinics. Uh, in order to get children to come to school prepared to learn, then we will by trying to uh, simply increase the expectations of teachers and hold them accountable for higher achievement. Certainly. We should try to improve the quality of instruction, but it's not the most important or powerful thing we can do if we want to improve achievement. Likewise, if we want to increase the share of disadvantaged students in competitive colleges, certainly college admissions officers should make great efforts to seek out such students. But their impact won't be nearly as powerful as the impact of the economic reforms I mentioned a few minutes ago. Educators should be outspoken advocates of such social and economic reforms, not only in their role as citizens, but in their role as educators, because such reforms would be the best way to boost student achievement and college preparation. So that's one issue. It's the, how do we deal with limited intergenerational mobility in this country and great inequality? The second issue, which is entirely distinct in my mind, and not to be confused with the first, is the obligation we have as a society to remedy centuries of governmentally imposed caste status on African Americans. This obligation is both moral and constitutional. I do think we have a constitutional obligation to enact affirmative action for African Americans. The first thing I was talking about, the desire that we all share, or many of us share, to increase uh, uh, intergenerational mobility is not a constitutional obligation, it's a good policy choice. But we have a constitutional obligation to deal with the caste status of African Americans. Now, there are many um, other Americans besides African Americans who are disadvantaged. They're stuck in low-wage jobs. They've not taken advantage of, of educational opportunities. They live in deindustrialized or rural areas. But that's different from the kind of experiences that African Americans have who are disproportionately lower class because they've been relegated to that status by racially explicit, unconstitutional public policy, which is yet to be remedied. This creates, as I say, a special affirmative action obligation. That's not merely a policy choice, but a constitutional remedy. 
Now, this argument is a bit easier to make now than when I initially reviewed uh, Cheryl Cashin's book because the events in Ferguson, Missouri, over the last few months have reminded us that African Americans have a unique caste status in this country. I recently wrote about this history uh, in the history of, of uh, racial segregation in Ferguson and St. Louis. I spoke about it here to some of you uh, last week. It's called The Making of Ferguson, and you can find this report on the website of the Economic Policy Institute. What I showed in this history was that St. Louis' zoning rules explicitly segregated black from white neighborhoods. Its public housing program segregated black from white working class families even when they previously lived in integrated neighborhoods that were raised in order to make place for this public housing. The federal government guaranteed loans in St. Louis to mass production suburban developers to create subdivisions and the federal government made a condition of those guarantees that the builders commit never to sell a home to an African American. Because they had so few housing options open to them, African American ghettos in central St. Louis became overcrowded and deteriorated. They became, in effect, slums. And once they were slums, that was justification for slum clearance, for bulldozing them, putting monuments like the Gateway Arch in St. Louis that you're probably familiar with, uh, universities and middle class housing in their place, and forcing black families further out into places like Ferguson. That's how the formerly all-white uh, suburb of Ferguson became all-black, while the former white residents moved farther out still. Only African Americans have suffered from this kind of explicit public race-based policy. Now, Professor Cashin says in her book that families with low wealth of any race are uniquely disadvantaged, and I certainly agree. But the low wealth of black families is of different origin from the low wealth of others. In the St. Louis history that I just described, in the 1950s, the federal government financed all white suburbs for working class families where single family homes at that time sold for about $8,000, about two and a half times national median income at that time. African Americans, I said, were prohibited by federal policy from buying into those suburbs. Today, those homes sell for seven times national median income, about $400,000, and so they're unaffordable to working and lower middle class families. White families who bought into those suburbs in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s then benefited from a century of equity appreciation. When they sold their homes or refinanced them or passed them on to their children, they gave those children a nest egg of security. Black families whose incomes might have been identical to those of whites who bought into those suburbs never benefited from this equity appreciation. As a result, Nationwide, while black median family income is about 60% of white median family income, black family median wealth is about 5% of white median family wealth. This is a unique caste-based situation. We should remedy this situation. South Africa, I might add, has done a much better job, of limited though it is, of truth and reconciliation for apartheid than we have. <clears throat> Remedying it cannot primarily be an obligation of educational institutions. Affirmative action in housing, for example, can have a much larger impact than affirmative action in university admissions. But affirmative action in university admissions also must play a role. And this affirmative action must be uniquely targeted to African Americans. To continue, my, to continue with my example, policies that desegregate Ferguson and St. Louis by creating subsidized housing options in middle class suburbs, for example, for African Americans, who are presently locked in the Ferguson ghetto will do far more to enhance the likelihood that children of today's Ferguson's families will be eligible and admitted to selective institutions of higher education than will relying on affirmative action and admissions policy. We should certainly do it, but not do it alone. Now, I know that the current Supreme Court will not permit the kinds of race-conscious policies that I'm advocating, and that I'm also saying are constitution we are constitutionally obligated to pursue. But what concerns me about advocacy of colorblind admissions policies is that if liberals deny that race has a special place in our policy and, constitutional, and we have a constitutional obligation to address it, there's no chance that the future Supreme Court will think otherwise. Policy don't, policymakers don't need less uh, race consciousness. They need more. Adoption of race conscious Supreme Court endorsed remedies is far distant. Our first obligation today, however, is to re-educate Americans about our racial history, which we have entirely whitewashed. 
unless Americans understand the disadvantage Afri that, that the disadvantages of African Americans today are not the result of accidental low income or of private white prejudice, but rather of a national near apartheid public policy, there's no chance that we can support, develop support to remedy these conditions. Here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, it might be appropriate to challenge you to examine any high school American history textbook. You'll find that the history I've just described is entirely absent or grossly misrepresented. I've done so. I've looked at these textbooks. The only reference in the most widely used high school American history textbook to the segregation of African Americans in our metropolitan areas is one passive voice sentence that says, quote, African Americans found themselves in segregated neighborhoods. <laughs> Finally, I just want to remind you that, that when Thurgood Marshall and his colleagues decided to mount a frontal assault on school desegregation, it was 1933, and they had a 20-year step-by-step strategy to do so. They started with segregated law schools, then they went on to graduate schools, then to colleges, and only 20 years later to elementary and secondary education. We need a similar time span today, but the time to start it is now, and we should not hold back that march by telling Americans that we can now accomplish racial justice with colorblind policies. Thank you. So um, thank you both for those um, remarks, and it's a great sort of start to this, this discussion. Um, I thought as I listen to both of you, um, I hear kind of slightly different motivations or goals in terms of the policies that you're advocating. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. So you know, one issue is this issue of inequality, um, and Cheryl, you really um, focus on um, uh, class inequality. Um, Richard, you're talking about the, the kind of inequality spurred by specifically anti-African American policies over time in the United States. Um, Cheryl, in your book, you also talk, which you didn't mention today, you also talk about white racial resentment mm -hmm. and that um, a kind of um, colorblind policy will um, bring people on board who otherwise wouldn't be. Um, um, there's also um, this issue of a um, <clears throat> A kind of diverse leadership, and you know the the desire. If we think it's important to have a kind of diversity in our leadership, to have a kind of sense of legitimacy um, in the leaders of our society, um, the courts have argued that um, the one rationale for affirmative action that the courts have upheld has to do with um, a diverse learning environment. Um, so, what is the kind of primary goal of your proposed policies? Well, I'm basically arguing, it's, it's kind of weird because if you listen to what I said and what Richard said, clearly there's a convergence there in terms of both of us being very concerned about the legacy of segregation. And what I'm arguing is that um, the people who need and deserve a leg up in admissions are those who actually suffer the disadvantages of segregation. Um, that, you know, economic segregation is rising fastest among African Americans and Latinos. Black one percenters and Latino one percenters that can move to opportunity do, right? And again, because of the influence of US News and World Report, I increasingly see it, but, but there's a valedictorian from every high school, right? There's, there's, there are just genius in every neighborhood, right? And so I think place better captures this legacy of segregation um, and the, getting to the point about white resentment. I, I don't come to this position just because I'm afraid of what white people think. I come to this position out of pragmatism, right? Um, the Supreme Court, there's always gonna be another Abigail Fisher, right? The, the person who recruited Abigail Fisher to sue UT is actively scouring for somebody to sue Harvard, preferably an Asian student. They want to, they're trying to recruit people to sue Harvard, UNC Chapel Hill, and Wisconsin, and because of the Schutte opinion, um, which says that it's okay um, for a majority of, of people to vote to ban affirmative action, there are six states now in which there's a mobilization to do a ballot initiative, you know. So, 
it's a pra I'm stepping into this space offering a form of affirmative action and diversity that I think um, is legally more sustainable and politically more sustainable and actually is more likely to help people who suffer this legacy of segregation. Richard, do you wanna? Sure. Um, there's no doubt that, that the policies that Cheryl advocates will pass the current Supreme Court and the policies that I advocate won't. I'm not disputing that. What I'm saying is that um, for us to uh, accede to that ensures that the policies that Cheryl advocates will always pass the Supreme Court and the policies that I'm advocating will never do so. And I don't think we should concede that. We are actually only perhaps one vote away on the Supreme Court now from um, a return to race-based affirmative action, uh, perhaps two, uh, but we can't foresee the future. I, um, you know, I've been around long enough to see a lot of things happen in this country that uh, I would never have anticipated. And I think that uh, the way to proceed is to proceed by plugging away at what you know is right, what you know is constitutionally required, um, and uh, not tailor your advocacy to only what is acceptable. Certainly we have to adopt policies now. Colleges and universities have to adopt policies now that will pass the must of the Supreme Court. All I'm arguing is that we not do that in a way that delegitimizes the real policies that we need to pursue in the future and that make it less likely that we will t return to an appropriate con consideration of enforcing the 14th and 13th Amendments to the Constitution. Um, can I, let me just also respond to this, uh, uh, to the issue of, of what the best way uh, to, uh, for universities to uh, enhance the, uh, the social mobility that I talked about. And I, I left the thing up there. Can I, uh, Jason, can we have that, the slide that I gave you? Yeah, okay. Well, I don't know how this works, it doesn't matter. Um, so hit the red button. Oh, See the, the red? Oh, yeah, okay. Red, and then you yeah, point okay. and you get red. All right, what this chart shows mm -hmm. is um, uh, the lack of, of intergenerational mobility in this country. The left-hand bar is people whose current income, fathers whose, whose income, was in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. And what it shows is if your father was in the bottom 20% of the income distribution, roughly if you add 36 and 29 and 17, almost 85% of uh, children of those fathers uh, are not going to be in the top of the income distribution. Now, if we had a communist society um, where we had perfect social mobility, each of those uh, slashes in the bars would be 20%. That is, if your father was in the lowest fifth of the income distribution, you would have an equal chance of being in the lowest fifth, the next fifth, the third fifth, the fourth fifth, and the fifth fifth. Nobody is suggesting, I think, that we should aspire to perfect <coughs> communism. We're not aspiring to a 2020-2020 um, distribution. What we're aspiring to is something that's more equal than we have now, but not 2020-2020. Can I have the next slide, Jason? This shows the same thing in terms of educational mobility. You can see that the, the, the charts are almost identical. Um, if you had a father who was in the bottom 20% of educational attainment, you are, again, uh, 37 plus 26 plus 20. Those are the educational distributions that are not college graduates. You are overwhelmingly not likely to graduate from college yourself. Now, if we really, and as I said before, I want to emphasize the major solution to this problem is not something for college admissions offices to do. It's economic and social reform. But college admissions offices can play a role. But if college admissions offices wanted to play a role in enhancing social mobility, okay, so the red one, does that work? No, no. Oh, did I miss it? What did I do? Okay. The red. Ah, There's okay. your red. There we go. Red dot. But where did it go? doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, if, if, you want, if you were a college admissions officer and you wanted to enhance social mobility, wouldn't it be more effective? Wouldn't you have more impact if you tried to make more of that 17% get up to that 15% bar so that one grew, more of the 36% bar get up to the 29% bar, 
More of the 29% bar to get up to the 17% bar if you're looking at low-income students. There's what we, the, these bars are roughly equivalent to educational attainment. The darkest bars at the bottom are high school dropouts with some college graduates. The next bar is high school graduates, but no further education. I'm not barred, the next slash of it. The next section is people who've gone to uncompetitive um, four-year colleges or maybe junior colleges. The very top bar is the most competitive colleges. Don't we want to try to get those, the children of fathers who were high school dropouts to graduate from college? The children of fathers who graduated from high school to go on to junior college? The children whose fathers went to junior college to go on to four-year colleges that might not be the most competitive ones? And those whose fathers went to the uncompetitive colleges to make it up to the universities? That would be a realistic program of social reform, rather than saying that our goal should be to get the, the children from the very bottom of the educational distribution and move them in one swoop up to the top. Now certainly there are some children in the lowest section of the educational distribution who will make it to the top on their own. As of now, 7% do. We could get that up to 8 9%. But the real focus of social reform should be to take each of those bars and move them up a little, rather than saying our sole focus should be, or our, our main focus should be, on the children of the fathers with the lowest educational attainment. Uh, can I respond to that? Yeah. I, I'm not advocating for taking the people with the least, whose fathers have the least educational attainment and saying they should automatically get into Harvard. I'm advocating for a system in which elite higher education does not reify the structural disadvantages that are in this society and that they acknowledge the structural disadvantages that people have overcome. So it's not, it's not my business to decide who gets in Harvard. I'm trying to blow up and, and, and undermine the increasing stratification of American society and, and create the possibility that a high achieving person with big dreams who, 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 who's done the very best that they can with what they have has the possibility of having the, the segregation they've had to overcome be acknowledged. And let me say, that one of the places I fundamentally disagree with Richard is this idea of suggesting because of our admitted long legacy of racial discrimination in this country that every black person in America has attached to them this racial caste. Yes, individuals experience discrimination, but I'm a little uncomfortable with a message that says implicitly there's something wrong with blackness and that has to be accounted for. And this is what ta Coates said in his piece in The Atlantic uh, when his, with his argument for reparations. What's wrong with American society is that they have not acknowledged the segregation. There's nothing wrong with blackness, it's the segregation that has to be overcome. Uh, and I'm more comfortable with that than some suggestion that somehow black people in perpetuity, you know, going forward, um, need this, this, this special accommodation when, you know, I think it's time for a maturation to acknowledge. There's a lot more complexity than that. So, um, yes. So, so you're both kind of talking about this intersection between race and class, right? Where um, African Americans in the United States have had this unique history that um, disproportionately makes African Americans poor, even while there is a, um, a significant and growing black uh, upper middle class and also a black middle class. Um, so I thought if we think about this kind of place-based affirmative action, um, the University of Texas is the kind of largest experiment that we know. So in 1996, the Hopwood decision led the, the state of Texas to end race-based affirmative action, and it's almost immediately afterwards, the, um, the uh, legislature passed the Texas 10% um, plan, right, which uh, said that the top 10% of students in any high school would be admitted to um, the uh, flagship universities. Um, and some of the research coming out of that program, um, that plan suggests um, first that there was a decline in the percentage of black and Latino students at these um, universities, a significant decline, and it sort of bounced back a little bit, but never made it to the pre kind of 10% um, plan levels. Um, and also that the students who were admitted um, were um, 
uh, given the, uh, when you look at the data, we're probably less likely to graduate from those universities. Um, as you mentioned, lower SAT scores, and that might be um, um, related to um, a, a weaker preparation. So if, again, if we go back to these um, goals of affirmative action, you know, do, do, do we think that's a problem, or sort of how do you think about um, the results of you know, what we do know about the, the, the one place-based plan? Um, uh, program that we've seen well, so far. Well, I, I like the Texas 10% plan, but I would never say it's the only thing that should be done, right? Um, the Texas 10% plan uh, dramatically raised the college-going behavior of not just top 10 percenters, but people who weren't in the top 10% across the straight estate, dramatically expanded the pipeline to the UT system. Um, and you know there was a recent article in the New York Times in which Paul Tuff went to the University of Texas and, 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 and interviewed 10 percenters. And you know, uh, UT has had to get better at figuring out how to make 10 percenters who come from very disadvantaged places um, not suffer stereotype threat when they get on that campus. And they found, you know, with a very modest intervention, um, a, you know, a 35 minute orientation, you know, which was, which explicitly and implicitly primed these 10 percenters to understand that they were capable of doing the work, they got better outcomes. So the, my, my point is that it, it, it has been a public policy success, but I wouldn't say that's the only thing that ha should, hap should have to happen. And colleges, I mean, I, I cite a study by Douglas Massey from Princeton about, um, he, they looked at t 28 highly selective schools in the United States and looked at college success among all racial subgroups. Um, and they found that the strongest predictor of college success completion and grades was cumulative high school B GPA, that was the strongest, and the second was this notion of grit, stick to itness, the willingness to forego recreation to do the work. And the SAT score wasn't the fourth, fifth, or even sixth, you know, it was nowhere to be seen. And his point was that colleges have to get better at screening for the non-cognitive skills that predicts, pr predicts success, right? Um, and that is what I'm arguing for, a de-emphasis, a, a re-interrogation of merit, um, and, and giving a chance. Posse scholars have an average SAT score, math and verbal combined, of 1050, right? No one would predict much from that. But these, these kids, they do amazing things. They come on selective campuses, and they succeed. So. Um, Shall I? Mm -hmm. So, go ahead. Well, you know, the world isn't divided up between the very poorest and the very and the most affluent. Um, Cheryl, in her her comments, talked about her own family, and uh, uh, you know, they are much more privileged. Um, she's a professor at Georgetown University Law School. I don't have to say anything more than that. Than typical middle class African American families. Uh, the example I like to use that's familiar to everybody is Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama's father was a, um, a worker in the Chicago water plant. Um, she did not live in a low, high poverty neighborhood. She grew up in a lower middle class integrated neighborhood. She would not be reached by the kinds of policies that uh, Cheryl is advocating. Now, the University of Texas adopted this 10% plan at a time when it thought that the Supreme Court would uh, prohibit any consideration of race. And uh, subsequently to its adopting of the 10% plan, the Supreme Court decided the Grutter case in Michigan, in which it said that you can look at race for purposes of diversity. It's a very light touch on race, but you don't have to only look at income or economic disadvantage. You can look at race for purposes of diversity. At that point, the University of Texas then supplemented its 10% plan with a, an affirmative action plan in which it could consider race. And it got, in the 10% plan, it was getting mostly the lowest income African American students in Texas because they were the ones who were going to the most segregated schools and the most highly impoverished neighborhoods. When it added this additional 
component, it got um, much more middle class African Americans who were much more li much, had much higher success rates in the university than the 10 percenters did. Now, I got an, an email after I wrote my review of, of uh, Cheryl's book from an administrator at a, a university who was following a 10 percent uh, type plan. And it went as follows. I'll just read you one passage from it. It says that having an African-American student body selected almost entirely based on these characteristics, which is like the 10 percent plan, a low-income uh, neighborhood or um, ten best, uh, uh, the highest uh, achieving students in a segregated school, having a student body selected almost entirely on these characteristics reinforces stereotypes reinforces stereotypes and sends a message to our students, faculty, and staff that poverty and other forms of disadvantage and dysfunction are endemic to the African-American experience. I would like to work in an institution where white affluent students interact with African-Americans whose outward experience is highly similar to theirs. Then the differences they experience would teach them something about race instead of teaching something about poverty. That is why diversity in public higher education is a compelling interest and in the use of race is important. So I think what we want to do is, it, it goes to the, the illustrations that I was uh, using from the charts. In order to enhance the participation of disadvantaged groups, it's not just the poorer students. And we'll get much more purchase, I think, if we pay more attention to students who are not likely without affirmative action to attend the most competitive institutions, but they're also not likely to be in the lowest achieving groups in our society. So if I could respond, uh, and I said this to you when you wrote the piece in the American Prospect, I think your statement of my plan, or my proposals, is a caricature of my proposals. You, you, you tend to suggest that I'm advocating solely for you know, the ghetto children who, you know, people who are in the worst and most impoverished. So I have a range of proposals. One of them is to give the kind of bump up in admissions that's currently assigned to skin color, which economists have suggested black skin can get you a, uh, the equivalent of 300 SAT points, right? That the, that kind of bump up currently should be available to students who are high achieving that come from a neighborhood or school where 20% or more of the people are in poverty. That's not the most, and that's, that is what most African American children are exposed to, right? So, Ty, let me finish, okay. right? I also say low family wealth. I disagree with you. I think Michelle Obama's, former Michelle Robinson, who I went to law school with, would be captured by, I, I, gar I almost can guarantee you, that she was in a neighborhood where she was exposed to some poor people. But low family wealth would capture the vast majority of most African Americans. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates said in this piece, quoting Patrick Sharkey, African Americans making $100,000 on average live in neighborhoods with white people making 30,000 or like, right? So, um, but I also say, in a holistic admissions process that has de-emphasized test scores and looks individually at what the student has had to overcome, all students, including affluent ones, should be invited to say what disadvantages, what discrimination they have individually had to overcome, which would capture, you know, a dentist. But at bottom, I have confidence in my people. We're not a crippled people, right? When the playing field is level and we have access to opportunity, we can achieve, right? And so I have confidence that the son of a dentist, you know, can get into a great school, at least they're in the game, um, you know, and de-emphasizing test scores and returning to merit aid, I mean, returning to financial aid and, and, and doing better outreach. I think all of those things will enhance the possibilities for racial diversity of all kinds. So I think, um, so I think both of you, and, and I think myself included, would agree that all of these things that you're talking about um, uh, are important. And, and Richard, you, in your piece, you also talk about how you agree with um, uh, that, that we should also look at place, but that there is a, that, but you argue that there needs to be a particularly race-based policy in addition to um, a class-based or place-based policy. Um, and so Cheryl, um, if we think about uh, place, um, it's true that African-Americans are disproportionately in 
um, high poverty neighborhoods. But if we look at the demographics of the United States, um, because that we're in a, we right now are in a majority white country, that the beneficiaries of this kind of plan would be predominantly white. And I'm wondering if this, um, if you see this as a problem. So you know, one argument for not if you look at zip code, not if you look at if you mo the, on average, white people are in uh, neighborhoods with zero to 14 percent poverty. Same with Asians. So right. the majority of black and Latino kids are in, in neighborhoods with more than 14% poverty. Uh, only 29% of black kids live in a middle class neighborhood. But if you, <clears throat> I mean, if you look at Texas, for example, Texas, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, looking by, say, high school, which is a pro proxy for a neighborhood in some sense, mm -hmm. um, the percentage of uh, blacks and Latinos goes down, right, um, through a place based policy. So, I mean, the majority That's of if Americans you're doing are white, right? Else. That's if you're doing nothing else. So you right? would, if you're not, if you're not working with Posse, if you're not partnering with Questbridge, if you're not doing outreach and going and going to to to, to neighborhoods where African Americans live. That's assuming if you do nothing else. And my research, I cite. There's ten states would have a ban. And and keep in mind, some states are, have this forced on them, right? They have this forced on them, right? And the ten states. You looked at research. I looked at research from schools. Yes, initially there's a huge drop, like by 50%. But as schools begin to innovate, right, in California, the problem is UCLA and Berkeley, right? Apart from UCLA and Berkeley, UCLA and Berkeley, they have gotten back to their numbers without using race. Um, for Latinos and African Americans, so, but any black person who can get into Berkeley can get into Harvard, and so that that's part of the problem. So right, so part of the problem is which places we're thinking about, right? Mm -hmm. Are these sort of the top, you know, UT Austin versus Texas A and M versus you know Berkeley versus UC Riverside? Um, but at you know, for arguing that we want to create diversity at the most elite places, um, I'm just wondering how how we think about this. You know, if we think about wanting a diverse leadership, you know. President Obama, for example, um, wouldn't um, qualify for this kind of plan, both because you know, he's the son of an African immigrant um, uh, raised by a white mother. Um, but I, but I, he it also seems went to the that, most elite right. school in Hawaii, and right. I think right. he probably very would have he's... gotten in, and he did. You know, he, well, he probably would have gotten in maybe, a lot of places. Maybe, but I, I mean. If we think that that pathway to him becoming, I mean, to the most extreme example, the president of the United States right. is important, and that those kinds of that kind of diversity it has symbolic value and importance given the racial history of the United States, then so, how so, do we think about that? So, most, like I said, most African Americans who come from advantaged settings are getting into schools. We'll, we'll get into somebody's school. You know, their parents are from a leadership class, and they're probably going to be in a leadership class. But what's happening increasingly is people who are from the wrong neighborhoods or the low opportunity neighborhoods are not getting into the leadership class. And, you know, I'm on the air. I probably shouldn't do this, but here's some dirty laundry for you, right? I mean, I'm giving, I've been giving this talk a lot. and. I was recently at a very prestigious school where the head of the, the African American head of the multicultural center told me, you know, that, um, he he was trying to do this mentoring project with a housing project that was walk, walking distance from the university, and the students that he had the hardest time recruiting to or getting any interest in going to this housing project to mentor high schools to the minister students were privileged black students, right, who come from these high zip codes, wanted nothing to do with it, you know. Um, and I'm just saying, so, you know, I mean, if you look at a Brian Stevenson, right, and, and, I, and I, I, I come across people, like I said, in the old days, you talk to a person of a certain generation, a lot of African Americans who went to these elite schools came from low upper sections, but you look at a Brian Stevenson, who's, who's developed, who, if you don't know who he is, you know, Google him, but he's developed, devoted his entire career, 
his entire career. He took his Harvard Law School degree and went to Alabama and Montgomery, Alabama. I didn't even, I'm from Alabama and I didn't go to Montgomery. Lived on a mattress and for like working for $17,000 a year for the most marginalized people in this country. If you look at his story, you might understand. He came from a poor neighborhood. His grandfather was murdered in a housing project, right? And what I'm saying, the leadership class, you know, needs to be more diverse. Um, I think what's dangerous is increasingly the leadership class that comes out of places like Harvard, increasingly they all come from the same um, milieus, right? And, and it leads to things like a financial industry that preys on, preys on ordinary people that won't pay higher wages. So I'm all for a diverse leadership class, but in a real robust, inclusive way. So uh, um, Richard, I want to bring you into this, this conversation. So um, you talk about the kind of unique history of uh, African Americans in this country um, when you're arguing for uh, race-based affirmative action in addition to um, uh, some kind of class-based um, affirmative action. How do you think about, in uh, you know, some of the, the um, Recent studies should suggest that certainly the most elite universities, um, it's the children of immigrants who tend to avail affirmative action. How do you think about um, uh, the children of immigrants, and should they be a part of um, race-based affirmative action? Um, you know, given given the history that you're talking about. No, I, I agree with with Cheryl that they either make it or don't make it on their own. I'm particularly concerned with how we as a society remedy. Uh, centuries of uh, caste-based policy, public policy, not private discrimination, but public policy that has uh, relegated African Americans disproportionately to the lower social classes and the worst neighborhoods in this country. Uh, no policy is perfect. Uh, it's certainly true that uh, at places like Harvard there are going to be people who will game the system in an affirmative action uh, program, although admissions offices could certainly distinguish those if they were looking at the people's applications to distinguish immigrants from uh, uh, non-immigrant African Americans. So if they're simply looking at the color of a skin, you're going to get that kind of perversion of intent. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus on how we remedy our racial history as a quite separate issue from how we enhance social mobility in this country. And I think we need to do both. And we obviously don't uh, remedy our racial history by giving preferences to immigrants from Africa. Okay, I'm going to um, open it up to questions from all of you. So there's two microphones if um, people want to. Julie. Hello. Thanks very much for your conversation. And I want to. Um, ask you about more radical and seemingly to me maybe more pointed changes that have been recommended in the past and have had no legs uh, in the policy arena but seem kind of more addressed to some of the things that you're talking about and I just want to know whether you think there's any um, not in a practical way, whether we could resurrect these, but in an ideal way to uh, address the problems that you're concerned about. So the first one was a higher education suggestion, specifically, that was made by Alexander Astin, who is now an emeritus professor at UCLA, um, very early in his career, probably about 1969, when people were discussing the beginnings of affirmative action and what to do with um, the problems of, of essentially extremely low percentages of um, African Americans in higher education at the time. And he suggested that all higher education admissions should be a lottery. And he thought this was a good idea because it would simultaneously deal with what he thought were three distinct problems in higher education. And one of them was the unequal representation and hoarding of opportunity that's so hard to overcome. 
and that affirmative action could only overcome a little bit. So that was one of his concerns. The other of his concerns was that higher education had become very um, homogeneous. You know, they, all institutions were kind of imitating each other, and none of them were trying to give a distinct mission or a distinct education. And he thought if it was a lottery, colleges would have to sell themselves on what they specifically offered students. And students would have to pick a college based on what they were hoping to get out of it. So he thought that this policy um, would encourage higher education institutions to differentiate themselves and on the education they provided. And the third thing he thought it would do was it would force higher education institutions to actually educate. He was concerned that higher education had just started sifting people already based on their um, educational opportunity. And they weren't adding much. They weren't doing much. And so he would suggested this as a remedy. And so I want to hear your thoughts about would this kind of idea, actually just a lottery, not if it's realistic, but would it be educationally a good idea for the issues that you're facing? And the well, second policy I, I just want to ask you to um, talk about is slavery reparations. So um, we're talking, you're talking about overcoming a history that's racially specific, and it is racially specific, but it really dates to slavery, and there is a particular group of people that is identifiable that suffered that um, experience. And there's a very particular targeted possibility of a policy directed at that experience. And so I also want to know if, instead of talking about race affirmative action, we should be talking about slavery reparations. So I'm interested in your comments on those two uh, policies that don't have any legs, but I want to know if you think they have merit. I, I'm going to try to be as quick as possible because I really want to get as much questioners. Lonnie Guineer suggested something similar to this a, a decade ago. She suggested because of all of this unfairness uh, in the admissions process that at one fifth of the places should be just allocated on a lottery basis, you know, and, 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 it, and this is what I said in my book, if you're not willing to really rethink the, the, the SAT, which most predicts the wealth of the grandparents of the test taker uh, and doesn't, isn't particularly predictive of, of college success. If you're not willing to rethink legacy preferences or racial preferences or all the different ways in which we have opportunity hoarding in elite higher education, then, you know, make some places available on a lottery basis, or at least say anybody above a certain number on the SAT will, will allocate on a lottery basis. At least you'd have a semblance of a possibility. So, you know, I, you know, I threw that out there. It'll never happen. As to slavery, right, if you read, like, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow or any history, there is a direct continuum from slavery to Jim Crow, to mass incarceration, to the endu you know, enduring segregation. Um, I'm not a big reparations fan, right? I'm a, because, in part because I, I'm, I'm from Washington, I'm a political animal, I'm you know, grounded in what's realistically possible, but segregation today, I'm advocating for people who, not people whose parents were slaves, to, you know, that would be Michelle Obama, right? She's doing okay, right? She's doing okay, her kids are doing okay. The people who suffer segregation today are the ones, that would be a, a, a logical thing to acknowledge, assuming they're high achieving, assuming they've taken the most challenging classes, assuming they've, they, they, do, they have all these other characteristics that do predict success. But doesn't that suggest mm -hmm. the intersection between place and race? If, if you're yes, saying the I'm not colorblind. Of this is what I've been trying to tell this man. I'm not colorblind. <laughs> I'm screening for a legacy, an immoral legacy that we have not gotten rid of in this country. Think I get upset about this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me take them one by one. We effectively do have a lottery. Uh, at a place like Harvard, I don't know what the numbers are, tens of thousands of applicants uh, each year. 
Harvard spends, Harvard's admissions office spends a lot of time and money uh, trying to distinguish between uh, students who are essentially the same, all qualified uh, to succeed at Harvard, and they pretend that they're selecting the, the top 1,500 out of 10,000. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's no difference, uh, no meaningful difference. It has some perverse consequences. You get a lot of kids who are trying to build up their resumes in high school for no reason except that they think they can distinguish themselves from other similar students. So we have this lottery. What I think we should do is, since we have this large number of people, of students who are eligible and fully qualified for admission to Harvard and would succeed at Harvard, why not put a thumb on the scale for African Americans in that large pool who are unrepresented in the large pool overall, but we could have contribute to the remedy of our racial history by um, affirmative action for those African Americans who are already qualified, who are in that pool, and could raise the share of African Americans in the Harvard entering class to something that's more representative of the population. I, you know, oh, let, 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 let me finish. Ahead. Okay. Uh, the second point I would make on reparations, I, I also, I don't talk about reparations, I'm talking about remedies. And uh, remedies are, I think, a lot more reasonable to think about. Uh, in the example, I can give you, a, you want a radical remedy that's not realistic. I can give you radical remedies that are not realistic. I gave you the example before of um, the fact that African-American students in St. Louis today whose grandparents were not permitted to buy into the suburbs when they were affordable now are not in position to be as competitive for um, selective universities as... Um, as students, white students whose parents were. So why, if, if, since this was a federally imposed policy that prohibited African Americans from buying into those suburbs, and let's say the population of St. Louis metropolitan area, I don't know, is 25% African American. Why doesn't the federal government buy up the next 25% of homes that come for sale in suburban St. Louis County and sell them to African Americans for two and a half times national median income? That would be a remedy that directly it wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to trace somebody's origins from slavery. It directly addresses the unconstitutional policy that created the kind of disadvantage that we have today. Yeah, and, and, and it won't happen, but I, I have to say, I appreciate you advocating for my people. I'm African American. I'm a descendant of slavery. But I got to say, and I teach race in American law, African Americans aren't the only people who have been racially oppressed. You, Native Americans... You know, they're Native Americans. There's a terrible, awful history of, uh, um, you know, one third of the land in this country was in, owned by Mexican nationals. There's a history of, of taking of that land. You know, Chinese people were highly racially discriminated against and excluded. We have, a, you know, we have a nasty legacy of racial exclusion in this country. And I personally am uncomfortable with the proposal that says only African Americans, only descendants of slaves deserve this consider. I think that's, you know, highly, you, know, you talk about some resentment, you know. I, I think that's, that, that's problematic. It's not true to a, a, a much more um, uh, expansive history of, of racial othering in the name of white supremacy in, this his, in the history of this country. This is terrific. <laughs> Not boring, is it? And confusing. Uh, I had one question when I got in line, and now I have two, if that's okay. Um, I'm the executive director of a program that does what you described, Professor Cashin. Goes mm -hmm. out into the city of Lawrence, especially poorest community in New England. And we work with middle school kids who are interested in summer enrichment, secondary school choices, and then college aspirations. <clears throat> so my first question is really granular. It's, it's right here on the ground. I go into a charter school, and I'm walking up the stairwell, and I'm dressed like this and I'm one of few people in the building who looks like me. And I bump into a fourth grade boy, Latino boy, and he says to me, he looks me dead in the eye, I'd never met him, and he says, are you here for the black and brown kids? I work at a secondary school, and I think a number of people like me come through his school, 
hoping to enroll kids for diversity reasons, all kinds of reasons. And he says to me, are you here just for the black and brown kids? Knowing that there's a couple of white kids in his class and it's an impoverished school and neighborhood. I wonder how you would answer that question if you're in the stairwell and you don't have time to get into economic theory and minimum wage and <laughs> everything else, reparations and so on. That's my first question. How would each of you answer that fourth grade boy's question? Are you here for just the black and brown kids? And I guess my second question, um, well, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. So I, I come from a civil rights family. Um, and uh, you know, I come from a tradition of intentional, multiracial coalition building. You know, my father, you know, we recruited the white Unitarians to help with the sit-in movement to sort of show white supremacists in Alabama that there was a better way, right? Um, that's what Reconstruction was about. That was what, what oh, the Civil Rights Movement was about. King was, had this vision of a beloved community. And part of what was successful about the Civil Rights Movement was the absolute moral clarity of King's vision, right? Nonviolence, you know, it, it, you know the, 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 the process had to speak to people's hearts, right? And, you know, I think with each passing decade, race-based affirmative action, when you have all this complexity, you know, and you, you, you know, not all black people are poor, not all white people are privileged, right? And so, I, like I said, I prefer to pursue diversity, which I believe in, in a way that's more unifying and that connects the dots between, you know, communities of color that have been, uh, you know, are oppressed and excluded, and, and struggling white folks, poverty is growing fastest in the suburbs, it be, begins to connect the dots. I mean, people who are frankly mutually excluded. Um, and, and, and I prefer that more vision of trying to, 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 to get people to come together and strategies. Yeah, they, they'll, they'll disproportionately help people who are segregated, but not all. You know, African Americans are not the only people who are oppressed and excluded. Um, and, and that's troubling to me. Right. So no, I'm not here just for the black and brown kids, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, I, 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 I'm not skilled enough to do yes or no questions. <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not in that stairwell. I don't have to do yes or no answers. Uh, um, Cheryl keeps coming up to this point, so I guess I want to address it explicitly. Certainly, uh, Native Americans also have a history of, uh, uh, that needs to be remedied. Latinos, less so. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk about black and brown because uh, we have had a lot of recent immigration of low-wage uh, Latino immigrants to this country. Um, we're not doing a very good job or perhaps not as good a job as we should be of assimilating them. But they are not suffering from the kind of... Uh, a history of caste-based policy that African Americans are. I'll give you some examples. 40% of third generation and beyond Latinos marry non-Latinos. You can't say that about African Americans. In California, 65% of Latinos who have lived in the state for 30 years, that is who immigrated uh, 30 years ago, now own their own homes. You can't say the same thing about African Americans. There is Latinos are not just another immigrant group, but they are probably more like Italians and Irish than they are like African Americans. And it's part of what I think is this colorblind mistake that um, allows us to obscure an understanding of this history of this country and how it came to be that we so often talk about black and brown and majority minority country and so forth. We have a specific history apartheid history when it comes to African Americans. It may be uncomfortable to address it for some people, but we need to address it. Because unless we address it, we're going to be in the same situation uh, that we're in today in another 30 years and 40 years and 50 years. And meanwhile, Latinos will be assimilating and becoming another ethnic group, uh, and, which is happening in California. In California, if you look around, the Latinos are, are blended in completely into the, the white population after the third generation. Not true for African Americans who've been here for many, many generations. 
Hi, um, thank you both for being here. My name is Lindsay. I'm a third year at the law school. I actually have two separate questions for the panelists. I'm not sure if we hit time is going to permit that. Okay, so my first question is for Professor Cashin. I was wondering if in writing your book and coming at your position, you considered uh, the work of William Julius Wilson, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, the declining significance of race, uh, the truly disadvantaged, and not, there are obvious, you know, substantive similarities, but specifically the legacies of those works and how you understood those legacies to inform your understanding of the allegiances that are likely to kind of crystallize around your policy proposals, namely the risks that could come from people um, sort of pushing um, the policies that you propose without the sort of same malevolent intentions, and also on the other side, the very likely uh, risk that there's going to be staunch opposition from actually the middle and upper class African American community, which I think, you know, to some people it's confounding that black, the black community has different interests, but putting that aside, um, so that's my question for you. How do you understand the politics that play out in light of um, uh, Professor Wilson's work? Um, and then my question for Professor Rothstein is, how do you sort of understand, or how do you account for the kind of risks and um, what a lot of people call you know, racial justice fatigue that comes from the idea of targeting exclusively racial programs and the mistaken belief that a lot of people think that, for example, um, a program like Affirmative Action has been intended to benefit blacks for many years when in fact it's only benefited um, a select few, and so people mistakenly think we've been doing this for 30, 40 years, it hasn't worked, we should try something else. How would your sort of proposals account for that sort of mistaken belief that comes with exclusively racial policies? I'll try to be very quick. I, I'm very enamored of William Julius Wilson's work. Um, I cite him in the book. Um, you know, what, what I'm most influenced by is his documentation of the role of place and how pervasive it is. It's like, you know, riding, if you live in a low poverty place, it's like riding the up escalator, right? Everything is, it's fairly easy, for, you know, to, 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 when you're surrounded by peers with big dreams and, and you know, highly uh, motivated, a lot of, you know, highly motivated people, it's easy to rise up. It's, it's almost the exact opposite in, particularly in the most impoverished places, but um, you know, so it's this this um, knowledge grounded in his work and the work of others of the effect of place and how hard it is to negotiate exposure to even a little bit of poverty. You know, um, that makes me be an advocate. I will never apologize for being an advocate for kids who have to negotiate violence, who have to, and it's not even the most most impoverished, but or, or, or have to overcome getting the, you know, weaker teachers or even like, you know, having fewer grocery stores, all these things that bound up into place and having people who have to overcome that, have that acknowledged rather than pretend that the lay, playing field is level, right? So I'm influenced by his work. I don't know what he thinks about it, but I cite it. Is, is that responsive? I guess I was asking more about the sort of the legacy of how we, the, the counterintuitiveness of advocating that race okay, is actually you, not yeah, as So it's, uh, I just, again, some of this comes from a confidence in my people, right? Sure. I'm surrounded by black one percenters who are doing everything right and, 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 and their kids are like the highest achieving people in their class. They were, you know, reading at three, doing everything, you know. And I was like, well, you know, I, I don't need um, I mean, they, they, these kids are going to be fine. It's like I said, they're in the game. Even, you know, they're, they're in the game. Um, so I, I, I'm very uncomfortable, like, you know, when I'm at, I, I think about a book party. You know, one of the nicest houses I've ever been to, you know, African-American home, you know, really nice brownstone in Harlem. And this one, black one percenter, I was probably a half or point one percent, like, why are you doing this? You know, it's, it's amazing to me how, uh, you know, I was raised to care about other people's children, right? My children could be fine, right? They got two parents with six degrees between them. Like, who is advocating for other people's children in this country? You know, and so I, you know, that's, that's most, where I came from, but most right? Non, <laughs> most non-poor black families, or white families for that uh -huh. matter, 
are not one percenters, right? Are not that family in no, Harmon, or even a family like your own, right? right They're kind of solidly middle class, and so, you know, I mean, if we think about the the kind of, you know, you're right that um, blacks are dis black families are disproportionately poor and disproportionately living in poorer neighborhoods than their own income, but. If you look at the numbers, the number of, there are more poor white families than poor black families right. in this country so, because we're a majority white family, even though disproportionately. So I think, you know, there's a little bit of confounding of race well, and class well, here. And, so, you know, uh, if you're said, focused on, on black poverty, then, then we, I would think that you would want a policy that focuses on be black poverty as opposed to poverty in general, right? Because all the examples you're giving are kind of, Poor black, you know what I mean? The, well, I, so I, don't I know agree if it's with about Richard. Poverty or there, about there are bigger issues at stake than who gets in Harvard, right? I, I, my career has not been devoted to writing about affirmative action. Someone asked me what I thought, and you know, a year and a half later, I had a book, right? This is what I thought about it. But uh, um, um, I agree with Richard. There are much, you know, improving the K through 12 pipeline is a much more important strategy. But where are you going to get the saner multiracial politics to do that, right? This is what the final chapter of the book is about. It's like building saner multiracial coalitions for fairness, right? And affirmative action is just a, a small piece of that. But it's an example of this question of how are we going to move forward and talk about what's real, yes, there's racial inequality, but there's other kinds of equality. And how are we going to build coalitions among the mutually locked out for saner public policy? As opposed to the backlash and to, to what I'm saying, you know, I, I wouldn't have written this book five years ago, but things are so bad in this country that I decided to have the courage of my convictions and say what I thought was true, because we're so broken, right? And my kids are in the game. <laughs> okay. Okay, so last quick question, and then we'll have I'll a quick response, respond. and then we're gonna. The, um, we'll All right. Well, this is this is actually a question specifically for you, sir. Um, thank you both for coming so much. I'm really nervous. I'm gonna say this fast. Um, so, to explain exactly what I'm talking about, what, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, to explain exactly what I'm talking about, when I was in high school, uh, and I was applying to college, this was 11 years ago. Uh, I heard a number of my white friends talking about, oh, like, I feel like I'm not going to get into the college I want because a black kid is going to get my spot. And these were not, I mean, these were not people I knew who had, like, I had known and thought of as having a history of racist comments and saying that type of thing. And it felt like in the community that I grew up, sort of the source of resentment against specifically black people that they were getting this advantage. And my question is not about the merits of is that justified? Um, because whether it's justified or not, I think it definitely exists. Um, and I worry about the harmful effect in terms of the racism that can be in our society from this resentment that can come from the fact feeling that someone else getting an advantage is you being given a disadvantage at their expense. And I'm wondering, if you think that is harmful, but you think that you know other factors of it are more important, or if you really just you know don't agree with that, but how would you respond to that idea? So, Richard, do you want to jump in? Sure, very quickly. I think we know what you're um, Look, there's a lot of things that people need to be educated about. We need to bring out into the open. We don't solve these problems by suppressing them. The answer to the particular, by suppressing discussion of them, the answer to the particular issue you raise is the following, and I alluded this to, to this before, and I'm using Harvard just as an example. There are 10 times the number of students who are qualified who don't get into Harvard than those who do. Most of the students who don't get into Harvard, who are fully qualified to get into Harvard because they don't win the lottery, the game that the admissions office plays pretending that they're selecting on merit because they don't win, are white. So if somebody who is qualified don't, doesn't get into Harvard, if a white student who's qualified doesn't get into Harvard, it's not because of a tiny few black students who were given affirmative action. It's mostly because there are so many white students oh, no, who are qualified I, I, who I, took his I place. I agree with you. I'm not asking so, you to, like, to you bear to... the merits of that. I, I'm asking you to address, like, are you worried about, like, the resentment and like, I thought the I said that, that I think that the way to address that is to open, discuss it openly and not suppress discussion of these issues. All right, thank you, sir. 
So thank you both very much for a spirited yeah. discussion, and thank you all for your <laughs> comments. Oh, yeah, sorry, and there's a book signing right outside if you're um, interested in buying a copy of Cheryl's book. Oh, and I also have some copies of my Ferguson report if anybody wants to take home with them. Okay, sure. Which I, I, sorry. I